My name is Jonathan Silver. I'm the editor of Mosaic. I'm the host of the Tikva podcast, senior director of the Tikva Fund. I want to begin with some acknowledgments, some apologies, and an expression of gratitude. The Jewish Parents Forum, a project of the Tikva Fund, is convening this discussion tonight. On behalf of myself and my wonderful colleague, Carolyn Burke, the head of the Jewish Parents Forum, we're just tremendously grateful to Rabbi Morgenstern and Rabbi Klinger and our hosts here at the Young Israel of Scarsdale, to our friends here in the room with us, and to more than 700 parents and grandparents who are in our Zoom audience, nearly 1,000 people who want to join in this important conversation. My friends, thank you. Before I say another word, I'm going to turn off my phone. And let me invite you to turn off your phone, too. OK, I want to expend a, uh, extend a special word of thanks to four extraordinary partners whose encouragement and visionary support has spurred us on. Thank you especially to Carolyn Rowan, Rebecca Sugar, who's here with us, uh, Nina Davidson, and Liz Lang. Thank you for your leadership. In just a bit, we're going to hear from one of the most exciting Jewish writers working today, the unorthodox podcast host, teacher, marathon runner, video game scholar, columnist at First Things, and senior writer at Tablet, Liel Leibovitz. Liel, welcome. Well, thank you. Tonight, of course, was supposed to be hosted by Tikva's executive director, Eric Cohen. The Cohen family experienced a direct COVID exposure earlier today. Test results are not conclusively back, and so out of an abundance of caution, a phrase that brings me back to April 2020, <laughs> out of an abundance of caution, Eric is not with us this evening, but we hope that the Cohen family remains healthy and well. Many of you know Eric, not only our leader at Tikva, but he is, like many of you, also an engaged Westchester parent. He's a member of this community, and we think it's important to bring tonight's conversation here we hope it's the first of many such conversations to come. So I'd like to share a few thoughts about, uh, that I have about what I'm seeing in Jewish schools now, the ideas underlying what I'm seeing in Jewish schools now, and not only them. Then I'll ask Liel to share some of his thoughts, and then the two of us will engage in the conversation and welcome your questions. Our subject tonight is Raising Courageous Jews, and I'd like to begin with that word, courage. I'm the editor of a magazine, and Tikva is an educational institution. We bring students and teachers together to study the big questions at the heart of Jewish and Western culture. Questions about love and death, and war and peace, and justice and injustice, what Homer has to say to the Bible, what we can learn from Jewish literature and Jewish history. That's Tikva. So, educated Jews is an appropriate event for us. Culturally literate Jews, an appropriate event for us. Those are events that I can understand. But what does courage have to do with this moment in our culture and in the life of our children? That's the question that I want to address. Where to start? Something momentous is happening in American culture. It can be felt everywhere. In the prestige media, in our universities, on television, throughout the private sector and its executives, and nowhere can it be felt more vividly than in social media. The momentous thing that's happening in our culture does not yet have a universally agreed upon name, but it is the reason why the statue of Thomas Jefferson was removed from City Hall. It's the reason that a loud and persistent minority of voices believe we must defend, uh, excuse me, defund the police. It's why at this very moment, when we need to invest and reinvest and increase investment in math and science education to compete with America's adversaries. It's at this very moment that mathematics is called as a discipline into question, as complicit in the systemic racism that oppresses Americans of color everywhere. As the public school curriculum committee in Buffalo, New York put it, all white people play a part in perpetuating systemic racism. Now, it's no wonder why race is at the very center of American upheaval. 
race is plainly at the center of the American story. Anti-black discrimination is a part of American history and the American present, and it's as ugly as it is undeniable. Slavery is our great wound. It will never, never fully and completely heal. And it's not really, to me, it's not really uh, controversial to acknowledge that. That's, after all, the view of Abraham Lincoln that he expresses in the second inaugural address. Europe is the land of aristocracy and feudal caste and monarchies and hierarchy. Europe will always be haunted by the ghosts of blood and class, but America will always have to contend with our original sin, and that is race. Racism, <clears throat> putting women and men in legal or moral categories on the basis of the color of their skin, is a grievous offense against America's constitutional aspirations and against the moral foundations of American democracy. In opposition to this grievous offense against America's constitutional aspirations and this grievous offense against the moral foundations of American democracy, in opposition to the school curriculum committee in Buffalo, and may I say, many other school boards like them, in opposition to perhaps the diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice committees at some of the day schools, in opposition to the contention that white Americans are by virtue of the color of their skin complicit in racism, in opposition to the idea that Americans are to be sorted into categories of racial purity and racial stain, we have a responsibility to, reform, to affirm equality. Now as Jews, as proud American Jews, we have a special responsibility to defend the idea of equality. Not only because on its basis here we found a home where we could flourish, but also because it is an idea with a uniquely biblical provenance. For all of the intellectual and philosophical excellence through which one is elevated by the study of Plato and Aristotle, the equality at the central core of the American constitutional order is not derived from Athens. For all of the impressive military and administrative achievements of Rome at its most noble, the idea of human equality does not derive from the banks of the Tiber the idea of human equality in the West is born in the radically subversive idea that every woman and man on this earth is born in the image and likeness of God. Now, if we don't take pride in stewarding that idea, in breathing new life into it, in defending it when it is under attack, in planting that idea at the very heart of the American ideal, who will? It's up to us and our friends, as we introduce yet another generation of Americans to the American story, to strengthen the moral confidence in them. Now that begins around dinner tables and in the classrooms of America's schools. So having dimensioned one aspect of this problem, I come back to the beginning. Why courage? We need courage because our public language is now distorted and deformed. And in the name of those politically charged words, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, it's now possible to hold the same discriminatory beliefs as the worst people who walk the face of the planet. So it's up to us to make an argument, I hope cogent and reasoned arguments, as to why we should teach the fullness of American history, but not distort that history into an uninterrupted cascade of moral depravity. We should model the kind of Americans, patriotic Jewish Americans, fully at home in this marvelous country that we want our children to be. We, their parents, cannot turn in fear even as we expect to be called discriminatory for opposing discrimination. Now, you say that the activists and administrators cannot be persuaded, so what's the point? Those people in Buffalo that I spoke of before, they're not persuaded by what I just said. Well, if you hold the view, as unfortunately not a few administrators and day school board members do, that America is stained and that white Americans must expunge their guilt by accepting that they are inescapably racist, if you hold that view, then neither I nor Liel nor anyone's cogent reasoned arguments will be able to persuade them. To this, I say you might be right. 
In a new book, the Columbia philologist John McWhorter calls the women and men who hold this view the elect. That is, members of a religious order whose faith is impermeable by reason. We're dealing with a form of devotion that argument cannot pierce. So why do I believe we must proceed making cogent, reasoned arguments to the elect, even though I don't think we'll be able to persuade them? We must speak to the elect, but we must do so in public so that other parents can hear us, so that they can be inspired by the courage that we have, and more importantly, so that our children can hear us. The kind of courage that parents need now, most of all, is the courage to serve in our, conduct, in our conduct and by our civic speech as examples for our kids. To assert the moral truth that is announced at the beginning of Genesis, the equality that American laws have never perfectly achieved, but aspired to make more real than at any other place in the history of politics. Our predecessors have given us an opportunity of inestimable value. And it is up to us, by courage at this moment, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. So um, it's a very tough act to follow. But since you did cogent and reason, permit me to take everything else. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, really, you spoke so beautifully uh, about Rome and Tiber. I'm sorry, my dog slept on my head. Um, about reason and, and Rome and Tiber. So, so I want to talk a little bit about something uh, that, that I truly uh, enjoy thinking and meditating on, which is me. Um, I want to start by telling you uh, how I got here uh, to this beautiful country, because I think it's an instructive story. Uh, I landed here on October 15th, 1999. It was a Thursday. Uh, I was um, 23 at the time, uh, and my earthly possession uh, were $2,000, uh, 200 of which were immediately siphoned off by a felonious taxi driver who convinced me, like in a freaking bad sitcom, that the best way to get to Westchester is with me. Uh, and so he took me from JFK to White Plains via, like, Boston um, <laughs> and gave me my first kind of welcome to America moment. Uh, but I didn't really care because the very following day I got up and I took the train to the place that represented to me the sort of pinnacle of all my hopes and desires, which is the great Columbia University in the city of New York. Uh, because, like many people here in this room, uh, I believed in this kind of uh, age-old, kind of chiseled Jewish tradition uh, of, of sort of education as the key to not only the good life intellectually, but also materially. And my plan was very simple, and it was precisely the same plan that generations of immigrants before me uh, had had throughout the years. It was this, I would go here, I would attend this institution with some of the smartest people alive, uh, I will become very rich in, in knowledge and ideas, and then in turn also maybe also very rich in terms of the good uh, fortune I would have by getting a kind of nice job that graduates of this institution often are entitled to. Uh, and then something terrible happened. It all worked out. <laughs> it all came true. I indeed got into that school. I got not one, but count them, two master's degree and a PhD, um, and felt very good about myself. Uh, I then got a professorship at NYU with a nice roomy office overlooking uh, what I was reminded every morning was a triangle shirtwaist factory, but also uh, more <laughs> pleasantly and less kind of genocidal, uh, Washington Square Park. And, and life was terrific uh, until it wasn't. Five years into uh, this magical mystery tour, I figured out a lot of things that many people in this room are already either beginning to figure out or are well on the way to understand. I realized that the institution that I once hail, held for being uh, the kind of custodian, guardian of all the fine traditions of the West that my friend here spoke so movingly and eloquently about was instead uh, a, a festering swamp 
committed to nothing more but the uh, kind of indoctrination of young uh, American men and women in this cultish, strange uh, set of ideas that bore absolutely no resemblance uh, to anything even remotely like the free and unfettered uh, exchange of ideas, exploration of uh, texts, and engagement in real intellectual life. Um, how universities became that way is a subject for a very good conversation. And if you buy me a drink after we're done here, I promise to speak for about three to five hours uh, <laughs> with great slides, charts, and historical examples. Uh, more important, I think, for our purposes, is what are we going to do about it? Um, and so I, I, I actually have a simple answer. Uh, but our, our dear friend Eric, who's not here uh, with us, but hopefully, hey Eric, watching at home, um, warns me repeatedly, and probably wisely, uh, that when I say what I'm about to say, I, I sound like I'm um, a few fries short of a Happy Meal. Uh, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I believe it. <laughs> 100%, and I also say it to my two young children every day, and it's very simple. Get out, don't go. You do not have to attend an institution that charges you an arm and a leg only to deliver what is demonstrably a diminishing return, both on the intellectual uh, investment and also increasingly uh, on the type of employment that you are likely to get. There are other alternatives. Uh, those two I am happy to discuss. Uh, and life will simply be better if we do not subject our children to four years of being, uh, being hated and discriminated against in institutions that give them less and less with, for more and more money with every year that goes by. I understand how radical uh, and, and unpleasant this sentiment sounds. I also understand that a lot of people uh, here in the room listening at home simply cannot accept for whatever set of complete objective um, premises this idea. Maybe you have kids who are already in college. Maybe you have kids who are already at some point in the runway where not going is not a rational solution. So what do we do? I want to posit four, uh, I don't want to call them prescriptions, but four things uh, that we could implement four understandings, four insights that hopefully will help us on this journey. The first uh, and the most mundane, uh, but I think quite important, is this. Our institutions are not going to save us. Like many in this room, uh, I go through the considerable financial inconveniences of uh, sending my two children to a day school. Uh, I know this is something that, that many of us uh, do, and, and like many of us, I think, I, too, have often thought that this is a very wise move because it will somehow magically protect them from all this mishigas that brought all of us here tonight. I love my kids' school very much. I think it does a commendable job. Uh, but I don't think it could do that, nor do I think any Jewish educational institution could do this simply because the tide upon us uh, is too great, simply because the state of the culture and the levels of the demand that these schools have to face uh, is just too daunting for any one institution or even any group of institution to handle. Everywhere you look, the lingua franca, the entire uh, zeitgeist, to mix my different uh, pretentious sounding foreign languages, uh, calls upon us to see the world in ways that are increasingly anathema to everything and anything that's not only American, but also Jewish. It's there in the culture. It's there in the universities. It's there in politics. It's increasingly there everywhere we turn. And it's folly to expect any one school, as committed, good, or well-resourced as it may be, to say, we stand athwart history yelling, stop. That falls to us. And it must be grand, and it must be uncompromising. We must say, for example, Eric spoke very beautifully about equality, but we may say, uh, for example, very clearly, which is another thing that I tell my young children very often. Um, I'm now giving you a lot of insights into the Leibovitz family life, um, that I fully do not believe in equity. I believe in excellence. 
which I understand to be a system devoted to the removal of any barrier any individual might have on account of race, socioeconomic status, gender, or faith in order to pursue the God-given set of abilities of that person. That is precisely the kind of distinction that got American Jews from tenement to townhouse in three generations. And it's precisely the promise of America that brought immigrants like me here, because we believe in it. If we go down the path of diversity, equity, and inclusion, if we understand or, or, or submit to the fact that we must now uh, count the number of members of Group X on any given panel because we no longer judge people by the content of their character, but solely because the color of their skin, we have lost this game, we must resist it. That's principle number one. But resisting alone, rejecting alone, makes for a very poor policy of any sort. This leads me to my second point, which is the beginning of what we must do. The first thing we must do, and this is, God knows, so hard for Jews, is know who our friends are. So many of us have these uh, very wonderful kind of subtle fantasies uh, that our group of uh, people, our tribe, our, the people who are simpatico with us, are to be found only in a very small and, dare I say, narrowing circles of people who traditionally we've understood to be with us. They belong in other ethnic minorities, maybe, or in the Democratic Party, or in other circles that, historically speaking, have welcomed the Jews. Well, the Times, as uh, one famous Jew who won the Nobel Prize not too long ago said, they are a change. And the realization that we need to come to right now is as fond as we are of complexities and intricacies, the moment is upon us of choosing sides. And on our side is a vast swath of Americans who believe, like us, that the nuclear family is the best institution we ever had in the history of this species to nurture human beings, that this nation and Israel are the two greatest nations on Earth, and that a simple adherence to the principle that have made this nation great is the best prescription moving forward. All we have to do is connect with these humans. Which leads me to principle number three. Having good friends is super important. But it's also important uh, that we not only be Jewish, but that we do Jewish. Tragically, a lot of us, too many of us, um, have looked at Jewish life as a kind of giant escrow account. It's an investment we make. We have some funds in it, and if we ever need to, well, maybe we could draw on it. Maybe we buy off-the-shelf solution like a show membership or like a day school and expect that somehow, again, by osmosis, all these nice set of values will pass on to our children and their children after them. You don't have to be a statistician or a demographer. The greatest, I think, by the way, profession of the Jewish people isn't a doctor or a lawyer, it's a demographer, um, to understand that that is simply not the case. Unless we make a real commitment to living Jewish lives, nothing much is going to happen. Now, when I speak this way, uh, I realize that many people listening hear a subtle invitation to turn towards orthodoxy, as Judaism at its core is a religion primarily not of what you believe, but of what you do. I'm not ashamed to say, in fact, I'm very proud of that has been my own path. But it needn't be necessarily the only one. The key here is to do something, anything. The key here is that the only thing that is the only kind of bad Jew out there is a dumb Jew, a Jew who doesn't take the time to learn something, to understand via amazing programs, this is a plug that gives me so much pleasure, that Tikva uh, gives Jews of, of all ages who are fortunate enough to partake, to learn about our heritage, to learn about our sacred text, to learn about the ways we've influenced not just Western civilization, but this here country that owes everything from its founding principles to its ongoing eternal ideas of justice to the Hebrew Bible. 
learning languages, learning traditions, connecting with other Jews, this sense of action of our children seeing us not just speak of these values so prettily, not just sign those checks, which again are considerable, but roll up our sleeves and do it with them. Learning a page of Gemara, even if we don't necessarily connect with the theological aspects being discussed, but just knowing that we belong to the sort of greatest and most ancient book club in the history of mankind. Those things are incredibly important. And they have a tremendous energizing value, which leads me to my fourth and blessedly final point, which has to do with attitude. Everyone here is asking, what can we do? The truth is that we already learned the answer to this question. We learned it in high school, some of us in junior high. Because we all know that the person in junior high who runs around begging to be part of the cool kid group that's not the person anyone wants to pay any attention to. The person just sitting there doing her own thing and not giving a damn what people think about her, that's the person who is going to emerge as the leader of that group because that's how human beings behave. I'm heartbroken to see how frequently the good, great place for us is elsewhere, in the editorial boards of the New York Times in the admissions commissions of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia. I think a major attitudinal shift is necessary. And I think the understanding that we need to get to is that, true, the hour is grim. All these committees in Buffalo, they're out there. But guess what? It's 1964. And those kids, they're the squares. Us, sitting here reading mosaic and tablet, listening to unorthodox, being in this room, learning dafiomi, davening, being with other Jews. We're the kids with guitars in the garage. We're the kids about to start rock and roll. And 80% of this country, first generation immigrants, long time working class people, minorities, majorities, everyone is going to be paying attention and join us. And I want to leave you with, with this one thing that uh, gives me tremendous comfort. It was at a conference not too long ago, and uh, this sort of, uh, I gave a very similar kind of, you know, rah-rah talk, uh, and some uh, high up in a kind of grim <laughs> Jewish organization, for lack of a better term, um, came up and said, well, what is, what is the cause of your optimism? which is, by the way, the most Jewish thing you could ever say. Like, how dare you? Um, and I said, I'll tell you. Because two hours ago, um, I, this was in, in midday, I was like, two hours ago, I prayed shachlis in more or less the exact same words that my ancestors had, had about 2,000 years ago. A lot has happened in the world since. A lot of empires rose and fell. A lot of haters came and went. And here I am reciting the exact same text and reciting it with joy in my heart. Because we, this is the best news you'll hear all day, we're on the side that always wins. <laughs>